So let's start by saying that most left-wing people do not believe in religious morality, meaning objective morality, you know, this idea of right versus wrong, of uh, virtue versus uh, evil. The left-wing movement isn't solely made of virtuous people and it doesn't have to be. Censorship is practiced all the time within liberal democracies. People who are in the position of influence can choose what to put forward and what to silence, and that is not necessarily bad slash anti-democratic. In France and many other countries around the world, jurisdictions have put limits on freedom of speech. For example, hate speech, which includes racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, ableism, etc. Who are your favorite YouTubers or channels that inspire you? Yeah, I forgot about Mina Lee. I guess Tiffany Ferguson is a big inspiration as well. Yes, all my friends are smart holidays. I'm so, so, so lucky to be surrounded with very smart, compassionate, open-minded people. I gave you a small teaser to illustrate precisely who we'll be dealing with in this video. It's been a long time since I documented someone who could turn everything on its head and still think that they live in the same world as the rest of us. Now, Alice Capel, much like Andrew Tate, speaks more of an entire group of people as opposed to herself. She represents a woman who is at the lower echelons of our ruling class, that is, being first worldist, rich, educated, or perhaps miseducated, having high cultural and social capital, and of course, totally clueless about the state of affairs, which brings her to the same camp as many other upper middle class white women. First world, white feminist, educated. This is a book about my family, <laughs> my grandmother's family. Lawyers, doctors, captains, chief in the army, industrial family. So yeah, I have very capitalist roots. But the thing is that my grandmother didn't marry the right guy. She married the 14th kid of another wealthy family. Her entire internet persona consists of repeating the latest set of luxurious beliefs, thinking that they're changing the world, diluted with a small slip into her personal life. The more you learn about the world, the more you want to change it. And who changes the world? Not conservatives, only left-wing people do. So it is important for us to understand this particular archetype, because despite it being a female, there is also a small masculine element to it as it turns out. First of all, I grew up being really into sports, being really into science, wanted to contradict all the stereotypes associated with womanhood. So being good at science, being good at math, being good at sports, uh, not looking too feminine, to sound cool and intellectual. I like to do that a lot. And if you're familiar with statistics, you'll surely know that women don't particularly care about politics, judging by their consumer preferences and general knowledge, yet they still vote at around the same rate as men do. They prefer to discuss feelings with their friends over exchanging knowledge, while the women who do care about politics either happen to be intelligent, well-educated, or have masculinized traits, oftentimes even becoming leaders of political movements themselves, feminism, the LGBTQ, women CEOs, and niche political interests are only occupied by women with masculine personality traits and interests, for the most part at least, as feminine women there are a rare occurrence. And I'm sure that most of the women you met that were into politics were not very feminine or had very weird things going on for them. At least that was always the experience for me and practically everyone I knew and hot take, this is not necessarily a bad thing becoming not like the other girls. Now, the case with Alice Capel is particularly interesting because she admitted that she got sucked into politics by studying social science, which is perfectly in line with the masculinized woman personality, and I would assume that had she been born at around 2002, somewhere in lower or middle Manhattan or even San Francisco, she would have probably transitioned into a man. But this is a different story. As a kid, I was so happy when people thought I was a boy. What I want you to learn from this video is the unfortunate story of Alice searching for the truth, only to get completely hypnotized by her social surroundings and subsequently wake up in the wonderland. So please, grab something to drink and enjoy the video. In the following segment, I will be responding to a video of hers in which she self-confidently proclaims that there is a parasite class. Take a listen. This week, kids, we are going to investigate the world of parasites. They are all around me at this very moment. So, what is a parasite? 
A parasite is an organism that lives at the expense of the host. In fact, since the late 18th century, scientists have started to observe a new species of parasites. Those parasites are particularly difficult to identify because they tend to look like human beings. I say tend because some of them do have insect-like faces. What? You want to see what they look like? That's fair. Well, here is probably one of the most dangerous of them all. It's kind of the greedy entrepreneurial category. Cool it with the anti-Semitic remarks. Now, yes, I did add George Soros there myself. It was originally Jeff Bezos, but sometimes you can't help yourself but notice certain similarities between neo-Nazis and leftists in terms of who they are choosing to pathologize. And for the clarification, George Soros is a bad dude, and in no way am I defending Jeff Bezos. I'm a community-oriented capitalist, and whenever somebody's capital acts against the interests of society at large, I become much much more hesitant to control it. But all of that being said, no person generating surplus capital can be considered a parasite unless that capital was generated through other people's capital. Think of the recipients of the welfare program, migrants that are not generating any wealth for their host country, aka almost all of migrants to Europe but originating outside of it, or groups funded by the government but bring no positive return like the PMC Wagner or the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. But of course, Alice disagrees. So the richer you are, the more dead life you consume, therefore the more vampire-like you become. That we continue to use terms like the rich, the bourgeois, the parasite class, that we point a finger at them to materialize their existence. The ultra-rich don't add much value to society. They accumulate money that they spend in ways that mostly benefit those already on top. Also, they are simply not compatible with the society we must create to save our planet. They are the parasite class. And what do we do to annoying parasites? And now that you've understood that those who generate wealth and innovation for society as opposed to those who are sitting on welfare while contributing barely nothing to society in return are the actual parasites and you know what to do with them, uh, so people like Elon Musk, Sergey Brin, Bill Gates or Kanye West, scientists, entrepreneurs, inventors, businessmen and other people who are responsible for economic prosperity, that is to say those without whom the society will experience a massive this genic and economic hit. Well, thankfully, we have the horrors of the Soviet Union, where they have actually went for the most successful of their society, and now every single post-Soviet country that joined the Soviet Union prior to 1939 and had dysgenic repressions is in full shit. And on the other hand, we hear that people on benefits are entitled, irresponsible. So to conclude, in his book titled Parasites, French sociologist Nicolas Framont turned trickle-down economics upside down by showing that the upper classes of society actually cost us a lot of money and don't pay a lot of taxes in return in comparison to working classes and middle classes. They are the real parasites. Now, to debunk the notion that the rich are actually contributing to society, she cites some obscure French book which is not even translated to English instead of, I don't know, showing a couple of graphs? Fortunately, I won't be taking her word for it. Here's a chart from taxfoundation.com in which we learn that the top 1%, despite being just 1% of the population, have paid about 42% of all income taxes of the nation, while the bottom 50% of the population have paid for just 2% of the federal taxes. And that's not even including innovation, scientific output, and stuff like that. Just pure taxes. But of course, you will never hear that from fancy universities and books that underpin Alice Capel's thinking. Instead, they want you to take them at their word, which gladly I won't do. She goes even further to stigmatize the middle and upper middle class by denouncing all landlords as parasites. Landlords cannot be ethical because the system of commodification of the basic human right that is housing is inherently unethical. All landlords are parasites because they suck a disproportionate amount of wealth from their tenants in comparison to the value they produce. Because providing, let's say, a student at a remote location with a living is not enough justification for a good service. 
She goes further, adding that Well, they have to accept the fact that they have chosen to become parasites for the rest of their lives. Thereby, she essentially disincentivizes her audience from finding an extra source of income, which actually isn't a scam. When you combine mortgage, the taxes, and other utilities, a new landlord is expected to receive about $200 a month on average. And while yes, more established landlords typically don't require a mortgage because they have either paid it or receive the house from their parents, the amount of money that they are making a year is not particularly impressive. It is about $10,000, or a profit margin of just 30%, compared to 10% for new landlords. Does it sound like they are swimming in wealth? I don't think so. I was struck about the number of times landlords completely twisted reality to make it appear as if they were producing more value than they really are. Imagine you've been earning and collecting money for the past 15 years in order to invest in buying a home to get a second source of a stable income only to be called a parasite by some leftoid snob who comes from a rich family and was born in a home owned by her parents. Think of hypocrisy. If you only knew about the truth of the welfare system, the taxes, the economy, or how the job market is structured, she would take every single word of hers back. Meanwhile, she prefers to do lazy copy-pasting of the latest leftist talking point without actually exploring alternative viewpoints. Sounds like probably every other leftist you know of. And why do you think is that? The answer is short and simple education, or as I like to say, miseducation. What is three times three? Yes? Nine. Wrong. Yes, Penelope. Gender equality. Very good, Penelope. She won't be able to explain why almost every single European country that introduced a wealth tax had later abandoned it. The countries that still have wealth taxes or other socialist policies in place experience a significant capital flight, and not all of them experience it on the regional level as Switzerland. She won't be able to explain why the European economy is so stagnant and weak compared to the American economy. She will never attribute it to the kinds of economic policies that the EU is implementing. But she will still advocate for censorship against you if you will try to educate her on the topic. It is in our democracy's DNA to protect and expand human rights and liberties, but it cannot happen without censorship. Oh, that's a controversial term. Hell, she even gets simple facts about reality wrong that aren't even political, but she still uses them to support her political agenda. Take a listen. There is no such thing as an alpha wolf or even a lone wolf. Wolves evolve in packs, which means that they cooperate more than they compete. They are biological socialists. Yeah, more like national socialists, and they do have alpha males, as wolves are one of the best studied and hierarchical species that we know of. They not only engage in fierce individual struggle for dominance, but also kill off the weakest members of their pack so that group cohesion could be maintained, and they also engage in group selection, a struggle for existence against other wolves. Something totally unthinkable to soy boy socialists of today, but not to people like Jack London, who, by the way, has written many books about it. But of course, to best understand the social dynamics of wolves, I recommend reading E.O. Wilson's Sociobiology, a book that I've been citing multiple times, including in this video. Regardless, the scientific literacy she and other members of the ruling class manifest is staggering. I bet she also believes in the noble savage myth. Here is another arrogant assertion about nuclear families being bad, and the argument is literally it's bad because non-whites aren't practicing it. Those broken families are generally um, heavily criticized, heavily stigmatized in corporate media. But in France, political consultant and author Fatma Wessak has turned a weakness into strength. She has flipped the media narrative to show that what they describe as a broken family is in fact an opportunity for experimentation, and even created a center for sustainability within her community. The center is called Vert Dragon. It is made of an alternative school, a collective kitchen, a place to let kids be creative, they also organize events. This part has been so brilliantly taken down by Britney Venti that I have to let her do it all over again, because whenever a mulatto woman speaks her mind, I sit my white ass down and listen, and so should you. 
Alice may try to make this seem like a fun, healthy thing where all children can gather around and sing kumbaya from the b-roll she shows and how great their lives will be without those pesky fathers around. But the thing is, children are notoriously violated in the foster care systems like we have in America. Children have an increased risk of being harmed when they are raised in single parent households. They are twice as likely to get divorced themselves, more likely to become a criminal, including a rapist without the G, more likely to develop mental illness, 25% more likely to self-medicate with illegal substances, and preschoolers are 40 times more likely to be touched than those who live with both biological parents. So if that's happening in a single parent household, imagine what is happening when you allow strangers to raise your kid like Alice is proposing. This is basically a welcome sign to predators. Group homes are some of the worst places to be in and it is clearly not a utopia. That's actually crazy to me that Alice will promote child community centers where a bunch of strangers are raising your kid over the nuclear family, like as a replacement. It would mean that the nuclear family isn't essential. I've noticed a pattern in Alice's ideology and the so-called solutions she has to offer, and it's that they're destructive. Whenever there is another race riot, our ruling class and soy socialists like Alice will blame it on video games or capitalism, while also say that this has nothing to do with immigration, because guess what, 90% of the rioters were French citizens, while of course blaming rich whites for being parasites on our lovely diverse society, while in fact the economy exists only because of them. In some sense, this sort of rhetoric, unfortunately, is not that different from our populist right figures like Patrick Deneen, Giorgio Meloni, and of course Marjorie Taylor Greene, or as some people like to call her, Large Marge. But this is a whole different story. Hunter Biden is the most disgusting, vile, embarrassment, piece of trash and that is what is a reflection on our country. Any attempts to show the truth of the matter will be openly suppressed, and funny enough, Alice sees no issues with giving the censorship powers to the powerful few so that they could take care for the rest of us, deciding which information is useful and which is not, much like it was the case in every socialist country. People who are in a position of influence can choose what to put forward and what to silence, and that is not necessarily bad slash anti-democratic. As the boomers like to say, this is literally 1984. But it's insane because throughout this whole journey, it's always been about getting men's approval. I used to be a massive people pleaser. I'm not as much now. And just generally speaking, I still very, very, very much struggle to say no to people. I always say yes. And sometimes it put me in scenarios where I'm like, what? What is wrong with you, Alice? But how masculine is that? Alice should have followed her masculine personality traits much more closely, because being right is better than being liked. And if she was predisposed to it biologically, I think it is only much better if she fully realizes her biological capabilities. The truth of the matter is that you, Alice, are still trying to appeal to men, but the men got replaced by the ideological social circle around you, which governs and controls your behavior, and you still aren't liberated. You're dependent on them, and you must follow rigid ideological prescriptions if you want to continue to enjoy popularity. Understand one's position in the world and to, to kind of challenge that position constantly. And I related to that so much. Frustrate me when I see people who do not do the work. You actually miss the whole point. Like, you want to be a better person, you want to be a nice person, but you're just incapable of actually questioning your place in the world. This is why you repeat all of those luxurious catchphrases like check your privilege or question your place in the world. But do you? And not in the sense about how you can be a better ally to the people that came to replace you or how your ancestors are the scum of the earth. No, that does not question your ideological beliefs but maybe question the origin of your ideological beliefs. Are they innate? Do they even make sense? 
Do they function in the best interests of society at large, or even your own interests? Studies show that white liberals seem to prefer to live in exclusively white neighborhoods. Does this ideology really serve your best interests? You have a rich white girl aesthetic going on for you. You won't be able to sustain it in a particular society that you're advocating for. Why don't you question what you've been taught and what society that had socialized you wants you to think? It's one of the best masculine traits, actually, to be a truth seeker, a nonconformist, to actually think for yourself as opposed to copy the opinions of your social circle and those who are more popular than you so that you don't get ostracized by them. <laughs> What you've been saying about parasitism without questioning is so contrary to reality that I'm impressed that this video was even published, but at the same time I'm not really surprised because this is the quality of our intellectual discourse these days. You could have simply googled the taxation system to see how much each class contributes to it. This is, you know, very simple stuff and despite you coming from a very prestigious family and education, you can't even do that. Yes. All my friends are smart holidays. I'm so, so, so lucky to be surrounded with very smart, compassionate, open-minded people. So how about you step outside of your comfort zone and try to get a different opinion on a set political issue just for once? Because people like me, that is conservatives who are also university educated like you, by the way, are stepping out of their comfort zone on the daily basis, not only by never being taught a right-wing concept in a neutral or a positive light, but also we get ostracized and censored whenever we try to speak up for ourselves. So why don't you wear our shoes for just a moment? Feeling good about yourself is all you're looking for. What's really audacious, on the other hand, is to challenge the powerful. I remember in sociology class, instead of sociology, we were told about the systemic racism, queers, women, and other fashionable language, but not actual sociology, a science of how society functions. Max Weber, William Graham Sumner, Lester Ward, Herbert Spencer were simply not even mentioned. Well, they were basically the pioneers of sociology, excluding Auguste Comte. I had to look for their work outside of university. Neither was Talcott Parsons, by the way. The closest I got to an actual sociology was the work done by Pierre Bourdieu, and funny enough, I'm using his language to label the scientific illiteracy of our elite, but even he was a blank slatist and I think also a Marxist. I find it extremely upsetting that sociologists feel so confident about explaining the whole without studying the differential quality of the sum of its parts. The best they can do is to study relationship between various parts, but even that is limited to the bias of what kind of relationships are being taken into account. Ultimately, it is people who make society. But sociologists that actually study people themselves, like Charles Murray, are not even to be found in the library. As a result, we produce overconfident leftist narcissists like Vosh who consider themselves in the position to educate the rest of society without even understanding their own subject. But the most outrageous thing that she had ever said was supposedly that only left-wing people drive change. And while I'm fairly used to hearing this from people, it always manages to annoy the hell out of me. Maybe because I have invented a progressive right-wing ideology which is based upon dynamic social change, moving equilibriums and things like that, but even conservatives are driving change. I will instead link her and every other leftist who is watching me right now to a video where I came up with a progressive right-wing vision for the future, which is an alternative to both current leftist social prescriptions, but also conservative ones in fascism. This is kind of like a fourth position theory, but with 
basically zero nonsense from Dugan. In the video, I also showed that people like her are not only miseducated and overconfident, but that their ideological and moral prescriptions are destroying society, and the more power we give them, the less of society remains. So it's an open invitation to every single leftist who wishes to actually question their place in the world, as opposed to utter this catchphrase without giving it a second thought. Anyways, that was all for the week. See you in the next one.